Hi, in this video, I'm going to show how the sigma notation, also called the summation notation, is used in math. I'll also talk about how in stats people tend to simplify the notation. There are two different sigma symbols. Sigma is a Greek letter equivalent to our letter S, and just as we have a lowercase s and a capital S, the Greek language has a lowercase sigma and a capital sigma, and they have different meanings in math and in statistics. The lowercase sigma stands for the standard deviation of a population. What I mean is you're given a data set. If you know the data set is a whole population, then you compute the standard deviation of it using the population standard deviation formula, and you write the answer as sigma. If the data set is a sample, then you compute the standard deviation of it using the sample formula and you write the answer as S. That's a lowercase sigma and it's not the goal of this video. This video is about the capital sigma. The capital sigma, this symbol, means to add things together. Another word for it is summation. If you use Excel or Google Sheets, you will notice that on their toolbars, there's a button with this letter. It's a shortcut button for the sum function that adds many cells together. Here's how the symbol typically appears. Sometimes it's also written like this, especially when there's not enough space in the paper to fit above and below the sigma, then people write them on the edge like that. Back to this notation. In addition to the letter sigma, there are three more parts to this notation. This is the main part. It shows the terms of the summation. And then these two parts go together. Let me show you how to interpret this. The sigma symbol, like I said, means to add things together, right? Well, what things? What are the things that we add together? It's this part right here. The things to add together in this case are the k squared. Those are the terms of the sum. We add the k squared together. And then the obvious question is, what are the k's that we're squaring and adding? This is where these two parts come in. We read them from bottom to top. Think of it like a vertical number line, like the y-axis. Numbers go from bottom to top, so we're reading this from bottom to top. These two parts say we're starting with k equals 1 and we're ending at 5. We just write 5 on top and not k equals 5, but it's understood that it's the same k. We're starting with k equals 1 and we're ending with k equals 5. And the assumption is to go through all the integers in between, not just the number 1 and the number 5 alone, but 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Let's summarize. This is what the symbol says. Sigma for summation or add together all the k squared where k starts at 1 and ends at 5 going through all the integers in between. Let's carry out the calculation. This is how you should do it. List all the k's from 1 to 5. We call k the index. We list all values of the index from the start to the end. Then we compute the k squared for each. Each k squared because the sigma says k squared. And then we add together 1 plus 4 plus 9 plus 16 plus 25 equals 55. The answer is sum from k equals 1 to 5 of k squared is equal to 55. Let's go back and look at what we did. In terms of the table that we just made, these two numbers determine this column of the index here. And the main part of the sigma notation determines this column here. And the final answer is the addition of all of them together. In an algebra class, sometimes you're given the reverse question. For example, you're given a sum like this, and you're asked to write a summation, a sigma notation for it. I already did a video about that, so check out the link above. Next example. 
sum from j equals 4 to 7 of 3j minus 1. Let's interpret this notation. Sigma is a sum. Sum of what? Of the 3j minus 1. What are the j's that go into the calculation 3j minus 1? For that, read these two parts. It says to start from j equals 4 and end at j equals 7, going through all the numbers in between. Now make our table. The index values go in this column starting at 4, ending at 7, going through all the numbers in between. And the computation is 3j minus 1. It goes over here. Let's fill it out. First line, j equals 4. Plug that in, we get 3 times 4 minus 1. Do like that for the rest of the lines. And compute what they are equal to. Now add 11 plus 14 plus 17 plus 20 equals 62. The answer is 62. The sum for j equals 4 to 7 of 3j minus 1 equals 62. Now a different kind of example. Given a set of numbers x sub i for i from 1 to 4, which equals 8, negative 1, 4, negative 2 in that order. What it means is x sub 1 equals 8, x sub 2 equals negative 1, x sub 3 equals 4, x sub 4 equals negative 2 in the same order that the numbers are listed. Compute the sum of x sub i for i from 2 to 4. Same approach as before. The index is i, and it goes in this column from 2 to 4. The computation goes here, and is x sub i, so it goes like this. x sub 2, x sub 3, x sub 4. Note that the notation says to start with i equals 2, so we don't bother with i sub 1. We skip that number on the list because the sigma notation says so. We can't add yet. We need to fill in with numerical values first x sub 2 is the second number on the list, so it's equal to negative 1. Now the rest of the x's. There. Now we're ready to add. The sum is 1. Two more examples before I move on to how we usually use the sigma notation in statistics. Example 4. Using the same set of x sub i, compute the sum i from 2 to 4 of x sub i minus 3 times x sub i minus 1, where all the i minus 1 is in the subscript. Same as before, make a table. First, the indices i from 2 to 4. Then the terms of the sum go here. It's just like the previous example, just with a mix of x sub i and x sub i minus 1. Let's plug in. For i equals 2, x sub i is x sub 2. Continue. For minus 3 times, 3 times what? 3 times x sub i minus 1. And since i equals 2, it's 2 minus 1 in the subscript. 2 minus 1 equals 1. We end up with x sub 2 minus 3 times x sub 1. Done with the first line. Do the same thing for the rest of the lines. Now we need to put in the numerical values. For the first line, the x sub 2 is negative 1, so put that in. Minus 3 times x sub 1. And x sub 1 is 8, so plug that in, like that. That's our first line. Which equals negative 25. Do the same for the rest of the lines. And add. Total is negative 22. That's our answer. Last example before I talk about stats. Example 5. You're given two lists of numbers now. The x sub i list and also the y sub i. Summation i from 1 to 4 of x sub i times y sub i. There are two variables now, but the process is exactly the same. Write the column of indices from 1 to 4. The calculation goes here. It requires getting hold of the x sub i and of the y sub i. First line is x sub 1 times y sub 1. The rest of the lines follow. Now plug in 
the numerical values of x sub 1 and y sub 1. x sub 1 is 1 times y sub 1, and y sub 1 is 0 0.35, plug that in. Same for the other lines. Multiply. Add together equals 1.05. All right, that's how the sigma notation or summation notation is used in math generally. In an intro to stats class, sometimes we get a little lazy and we take a little shortcut. This is why. In an intro to stats class, when given a set of numbers, we always use all of them. We never have a situation like example three where we're skipping the first term. In stats, if the set has four numbers, we always use all four numbers, not skipping any of them. We'll also never have a situation like example four, where data of different index values are mixed together. That is because in the intro stats, data assumed to come from a random sample. So we never analyze what happens when one number follows another in some sort of orderly manner. In a more advanced stats class, yes. In intro stats, no. Therefore, what we do in intro stats sometimes is we skip the indices. It makes the notation look less busy and easier to follow. Let's look at example five again. We were given a set of x's and a set of y's and we're computing the sum of x sub i times y sub i. In statistics, we would skip the subscript and just write x and y. But now there's a problem. With the index, we can make sure the x sub 1 goes with y sub 1. Because they both share the equal index of i. So when i is equal to 1, they are both x1 and y1. Once we skip the indices, how do we make sure the x and y still go together parallel like that? That's why typically in the stats class, we would write in such a way that we understand the values correspond or are paired up. We would probably use something like a table like this. And then we just write the sigma notation without indices. Just sum of x times y without any index. Here's another example. Let's say we want to write the formula for the mean or average of several numbers. To compute the mean, we add all the numbers together and then divide by how many there are, right? How many there are is called the sample size and is written with the letter N. In algebra, we would write the formula like this. Add all the x of i together from the first where i equals 1 to the last where i equals N. Then divide by N. That's the formula in algebra. Very precise, no ambiguity. In statistics, we'd skip the indices and just write like this. A lot more convenient. People who are purists may say, wait, that's ambiguous. How do I know where to start and where to end? That's the thing though. In stats, we always take all the data points. We always start at the beginning and end at the end. That's why we don't need to say it. By the way, I'm not saying that everyone writes without the indices like this. Many people do write the sigma notation out in full. But many, especially in the classroom, skip the indices. I like it because it's less messy for the students. Last example, example seven. Suppose we have these x values that go with function p of x. Compute sigma of x times p of x. So we have a table just like last time with x and y, but instead of putting the table vertically, we have the table horizontally. There's no index in the notation, but because the x and the p of x come together in a table like this, we know they go together. The x equals negative three will go with its own p of x equals 0 0.3, not some other p of x. The terms of the summation or x times p of x, so let's write that down. Put in a new row for the terms x times p of x. 
the first x is negative 3 and p of x is 0 0.3. So write that x times p of x in the table. Next is 2 times 0 0.2. Next. Next. Then multiply. And then add equals 0 0.45. The answer is 0 0.45. All right, I hope that helps. Any questions, ask in the comments and I'll answer them. Like, share, and subscribe for more contents. Thanks for watching. Bye.